Okay, the next chapter that we're going to discuss is articulations and joints. Now, because the bones of the skeleton are relatively inflexible, movement can only occur at articulations or joints, and this is where bones interconnect, and that's really what we're going to be exploring uh, in this, this uh, video lecture. Now, each joint ultimately reflects a compromise between the need for strength and the need for mobility. As a result, articulations will differ in the amount of movement permitted, and this property is known as range of motion. The anatomical structure of a joint determines the type and amount of movement that may occur. The functional classifications of joints, um, which are based upon range of motion allowed, are uh, really three different categories. We have synarthrotic, amphiarthrotic, and diarthrotic. Now, synarthrotic joints allow no movement. At synarthrotic joints, the bony edges are actually quite close together and they may even interlock. This is extremely strong and really you're going to have no movement at all and that's the purpose of these joints. Amphiarthrotic joints will allow for a slight amount of movement and these joints will permit more movement than say a synarthrotic joint, uh, but it's still much stronger than a freely movable joint. And a diarthrotic joint, it's this freely movable joint. Now, these joints provide a wide range of motion, and they're typically seen in the joints of our appendages, our limbs, our upper bodies and lower bodies. Now, joints will weaken with increased range of motion. It's important to understand that. Uh, and there are reinforcing structures that are in our joints to counteract that weakness. We will be discussing some of those later on in this presentation. And I also wanted to mention dislocation. Now, uh, a dislocation is one uh, type of a joint injury that may occur when you have forced a change, uh, a broad reaching change at the articulating surface of a joint. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that uh, a little bit later on. So that was the functional classification of joints, but they can also be classified based upon their structure. The structural classification of a joint, it's based upon the anatomical components that make up the joint. And there are three main categories, fibrous joints, cartilaginous joints, and synovial joints. Fibrous joints are held together by fibrous connective tissue, but they lack cartilage and they possess no cavity between the bones. Fibrous joints are either synarthrotic or amphiarthrotic. Cartilaginous joints are held together by fibrous connective tissue, such as ligaments, but they also possess either hyaline cartilage or fibrocartilage. Cartilaginous joints will ultimately lack a joint cavity, and they're either synarthrotic or amphiarthrotic. Synovial joints, on the other hand, they're held together by fibrous connective tissue, hyaline cartilage and or fibrocartilage, and they do possess a joint cavity. All synovial joints are diarthrotic, and synovial joints are actually quite complex in structure uh, and are the most numerous actually, they're the most numerous type of joint in the, in the whole body and they permit the greatest range of motion, that's their complexity and because of this we're going to talk about these particular types of joints in, in a lot more detail. Now just one other point, there are also subclassifications of each of the joints. For example, fibrous joints can be subclassified as sutures or syndesmoses or gomphoses. Cartilaginous joints can be subclassified as synchondrosis or symphysis or symphyses. Uh, and then synovial joints, uh, like I said, we're going to be discussing their, their special features. Okay, so let's first take a look at fibrous joints. Fibrous joints, one of the subcategories, as I mentioned, are sutures. Sutures are a synarthrotic joint located between the bones of the skull. The edges of the bones are interlocked and bound together at that suture by dense fibrous connective tissue. Syndesmoses, they're a type of fibrous joint where the bones are connected by an interosseous ligament and are amphiarthrotic. The most common example here is the distal articulation uh, between your two leg bones, your tibia and your fibula, and that's called the tibiofibular joint. Gomphoses, that's a synarthrotic joint, also known as a peg and socket joint. This type of joint is found in the maxilla and the mandible, around your jaw area, 
And this is where the teeth are fixed securely in the sockets of the alveolar margins. The fibrous connective tissue between the tooth and the socket, that's called a periodontal ligament. Cartilaginous joints can be subcategorized as synchondroses or symphyses. A synchondrosis joint, it is a rigid, highly, cartilag uh, highly cartilaginous bridge that unites the bones of this type of joint. Now one example is the cartilaginous joint that's found between the ends of the pair of ribs at the manubrium of the sternum. Another example is the epiphyseal plate found holding the epiphysis of long bones to the diaphysis. Symphyses are ultimately where you have articulating bones that are separated by kind of a wedge or a pad of fibrocartilage. The articulation between the vertebrae, for example, where the thick pad of the fibrocartilage forms the intervertebral disc, is a common example of this type of joint. Also, the pubis symphysis is another example of, uh, of this type of joint. And here, as I mentioned, you can see the intervertebral discs. That's one of the examples that we just mentioned. Uh, and then here, this is an example, of another one of those joints, the uh, pubis symphysis. Okay, synovial joints. Now remember, they are freely movable, and these types of joints have some characteristics that you need to know about. They have articulating bones that are separated by a fluid-filled cavity, a joint cavity. Uh, so not only are synovial joints composed of a fibrous connective tissue that we've been talking about, and they possess cartilage, they also possess a space between the articulating bones called this synovial cavity, and then as a result, they're gonna contain this synovial fluid. This fluid, it's largely derived from blood and has a clear kind of viscous egg white consistency. Even in large joints such as the knee, the total quantity of synovial fluid, it's pretty small. It's normally less than about three milliliters. There are three primary functions of synovial fluid that you need to know about. We're gonna talk a little bit about them, and that includes lubrication and nutrient absorption and shock absorption. Okay, let's talk a little bit more in detail about some of these features. Now, lubrication occurs when a part of an articular cartilage is compressed during movement. Some of this synovial fluid ultimately is squeezed out of the cartilage and into the space between the opposing surfaces. And in turn, this thin layer of fluid will significantly reduce friction between the two moving surfaces. This is actually called weeping lubrication. Nutrient uh, distribution and absorption, that's when synovial fluid um, in a joint ultimately circulates continuously to provide nutrients and waste disposal of the chondrocytes of the articular cartilage. It circulates actually whenever movement occurs and when there's repeated compression and expansion of the articular cartilage, you have this pumping action that ultimately pumps synovial fluid into and out of the, the cartilage uh, matrix. And then finally, shock absorption. Now, shock absorption is when a joint is subjected to compression. The synovial fluid provides a cushion against this shock. So for example, when you jog, your knees are rather compressed and the synovial fluid uh, ultimately will distribute that force evenly across the whole articular surface uh, of the joint and it can ultimately lower forces and save your knee a little bit. Now, there are some accessory structures that are typical of synovial joints, and I want you to know about them. Bursa is one. Bursa, it's a small fluid-filled pocket that forms in a connective tissue. It contains synovial fluid and is lined by a synovial membrane as a result. Bursa often form when a tendon or a ligament rub against other tissue. It's located around most synovial joints, and this ultimately reduces friction and acts as a shock absorber. Fat pads are another type of accessory structure in synovial joints. Fat pads are localized masses of adipose tissue covered by a layer of synovial membrane. They are commonly superficial to the joint capsule, and fat pads ultimately protect the articular cartilage and act as kind of a packing material for the joint. When the bones move, the pads fill the spaces created uh, as the joint cavity changes in shape. And we also have meniscus. Now meniscus, it's a pad of fibrous cartilage and it's found between opposing bones within the synovial joint. Menisci may actually subdivide a synovial cavity 
uh, channel the flow of sino synovial fluid, or even allow for variations in the shape of the articular surface. Uh, and of course we have ligaments. Now ligaments also do many things. They support, uh, they strengthen and reinforce synovial joints. And you can have intrinsic ligaments, also called capsular ligaments, which are kind of parallel bundles of fibers creating thickening within the joint capsule. Extrinsic ligaments may pass outside or extracapular or inside intracapular the joint capsule. Now, many different types of movements can occur at synovial joints and you should be familiar with these types of movements. For example, extension is a type of movement that increases an angle between the limbs. It's an angular movement, ultimately within the anterior posterior plane that increases the angle between the articulating elements. An example of this would be lowering a dumbbell back to the starting position you know, as you're working out. Plantar flexion, it's a type of movement that is the opposite of dorsiflexion, which we're gonna talk about in a little bit. And it's ultimately when you extend the ankle uh, and elevate the heel, like kind of when you're pointing your toes. Hyperextension, it's an angular movement as well. It's where the body is extended past the anatomical position, like when you're looking up at the stars and it can happen at many different joints. Flexion is the opposite of extension and this is where you are decreasing or reducing the angle between two articulating elements, like for example, lifting the dumbbell in a biceps curl. And of course there are subcategories, lateral flexion and dorsiflexion. Dorsiflexion is flexion at the ankle in particular, uh, and elevation of the sole, like when you dig your heels into the ground. Circumduction is when you move a limb in a circle, creating kind of like a cone in space. Abduction or abduction is angular movement within the lateral medial plane that moves the body part away from the longitudinal axis, uh, kind of like the first phase of a jumping jack. And then in contrast to abduction, you have adduction. Now adduction, the best way to think about it is adding. So you're adding to your body. And so it's the angular movement within the lateral medial plane that moves the body part toward the longitudinal axis kind of like the second part of a jumping jack. And then we have rotation. This is where you're moving around a fixed point. Medial rotation, for example, is uh, where the, let's say, anterior surface of a limb turns toward the midline of a body. And then so we have the opposite of that's lateral rotation. Uh, that's where the anterior surface of a limb turns away from the midline of the body. And then we have supination, uh, the anatomical position here, the forearm is supinated with the radius and ulna parallel to each other uh, and the palms facing anteriorly. Uh, a good way to think about supination is Oliver Twist when he's walking up and asking for more soup. Uh, supination uh, lifts his palms up to the sky and asks for more soup, please. Um, on the other hand, pronation is when the shaft of the radius rotates the distal epiphysis of the radius rolls across the anterior surface of the ulna so that the bones are crossing, the palms face posterior or down, kind of like when you're you know, dribbling a, a ball. And there's a lot of types of synovial joint movement, so here's some more. Opposition, it's the movement of a thumb towards the surface of the palm uh, or the pads you know, of the fingers, for example, like when you're snapping music snapping to music rather, snapping your fingers. Uh, protraction is when you move a body part anteriorly, anteriorly rather in the horizontal plane. Retraction then, it's the opposite to protraction, that's when you're moving uh, a body part posteriorly in the horizontal plane. Inversion is a twist motion of the foot and it turns the sole inward, elevating the medial ridges of the sole. Eversion, it's the opposite to inversion, and that's a twisting motion of the foot that turns the sole outward. Depression is when a structure moves inferiorly, kind of like opening the mouth. And elevation, then, is when a structure moves superiorly, kind of like when you close your mouth. Now, as we kind of alluded, our joints do provide for mobility, but as we have a greater range of motion, ultimately the, the structural integrity, the weakness of the joint increases. 
So our thinner, our, our synothrotic joints are the strongest then because they have no movement, but they have the smallest amount of movement, so they're not very functional. The diathrotic are the most mobile joints and generally are, are the weakest. So we have this trade-off that we, we try to, to understand. Now, one type of joint injury is a dislocation, which is also known as luxation. And obviously we need to be aware of this given the trade-offs that we just mentioned. Uh, it's basically when a reinforcing structure cannot protect a joint from extreme stress, extreme ranges of motion or force applied to it. The articulating surfaces then, as a result of this, may be forced out of position. The displacement here may damage a whole bunch of different things, the articular cartilage, it may tear ligaments, uh, it may distort the whole joint capsule, you may have all sorts of other um, damage as well. Uh, and now the problem is, you know, there's no, uh, there's no pain receptors inside your joint, um, but nerves that monitor the capsule and ligaments and tendons, they're actually quite sensitive. So as a result of this, dislocations can be very painful. Uh, and then the last thing I wanted to mention is we can have not always just full dislocations, you can have a partial dislocation and that's called a subluxation. There are six types of synovial joints that you should be familiar with and they're listed here. Pivot, hinge, saddle, and then we talk about plane, condyloid, and ball and socket. Now for each of these types of joints, they are described based upon the types of surfaces or the shape of the articulating surfaces of the bones. So they're basically an anatomical class of synovial joint you know, based upon the shape of the articulating surface of the bone. A pivot joint is where you have the rounded end of the bone that ultimately protrudes into a sleeve or ring composed of a bone or ligament. The proximal radio ulnar joint is an example here or the dens of the axis of the atlas is another example. A hinge joint is where you have a cylindrical projection of a bone that fits into a trough shaped surface on another bone. So for example, your elbow, or your knee joint are examples of this. And then a saddle joint is where you have an articulating surface that has kind of a concave area on it that fits ultimately with a convex area of another. And so here, the first uh, carpal metacarpal joint on the thumb is an example of this. A plane joint, it's also known as a gliding joint, and this is where you have articular surfaces that are flat and only allow for a sort of gliding movement that are rather short. And here, an example is a sacroiliac joint. A condyloid joint, it's also known as an ellipsoid joint. And this is where you have an oval articular surface of one bone into a complementary depression in another. And here an example is the radiocarpal joint. And finally, we have the ball and socket joint, which most people are familiar with. This is where you have the spherical end of one bone that articulates with a cup-like socket on the other bone. And your shoulders and hip joints are examples of these. Uh, and they are, as you might guess, rather uh, unstable. And here you can see actually an example of the pivot joint, uh, which we talked about a little bit earlier. Uh, now, there are various types of joint injuries that you should be familiar with, and we already talked about dislocations, but sprains are another type of common joint injury. And a sprain is where you stretch or tear a ligament across the joint capsule. Bursitis, tendonitis, uh, synovitis, they're all referring to inflammation. Uh, the trick with the inflammation, it's always the itis at the end, so you can pretty much pick out an inflammation issue uh, across A&P with that little trick. Now, whether it's an inflamed bursa in the case of bursitis or inflamed tendon with tendonitis or an inflammation of the synovial membrane with um, synovitis. So while we're on the topic of inflammation now, arthritis is an inflammatory or degenerative disease of the joint where synovial membranes thicken and fluid protection decreases resulting in friction and pain. Arthroscopic surgery actually may be necessary to treat joint injuries or uh, artificial joints may be needed uh, to be installed uh, through, through rather invasive procedures when a joint is uh, damaged beyond repair. Now there's a couple of types I wanted to mention. Osteoarthritis, it's also known as a degenerative arthritis, 
uh, or degenerative joint disease and generally affect individuals older than 60 years of age, so it's kind of a gradual wearing out. Uh, it can result from accumulative effects, as I said, of wear and tear on the joint surface or actually not just age-related and overuse. It could be a genetic issue affecting uh, collagen formation. Now, in the United States, about 25% of women and about 15% of men over the age of 60 actually show sign of this condition. So this should be contrasted with rheumatoid arthritis, which is an autoimmune disease, and this can occur at any age, but it's actually more common in middle-aged uh, individuals and women. Now, women actually get more rheumatoid arthritis than men. Uh, infection, genes, and hormone changes that can occur you know, at various phases of your life may be linked to this. Now, rheumatoid arthritis usually affects joints on both sides of the body equally, which is another indication that it's not associated with uh, any particular wear and tear. The disease actually starts out rather slowly, only with minor pain, but it can progress to be extremely debilitating. Uh, another condition, uh, gout arthritis or gout, gouty arthritis, it's caused by too much uric acid in the blood. And most of the time, having too much uric acid is not particularly harmful. Many people with high levels in their blood never get gout, but when uric acid levels in the blood are too high, the uric acid may be uh, um, caused to form what are called uh, crystals in your joints, and that may cause an attack of sudden burning and pain and stiffness and swelling in the joint and it often actually occurs in the big toe. Now these attacks they can happen over and over unless it's treated and actually it's more more common in men. Uh, and here are some examples of types of movements that we talked about earlier demonstrating the different types of movements at synovial joints. It's a bit of a busy slide, there's a lot on it, but I wanted to make sure that you have the details here. Essentially, uh, you've got some representative pictures demonstrating flexion, extension, hyperextension, uh, abduction, adduction, etc. Uh, and again, here are further images and descriptions uh, of, uh, of those movements. I just wanted to make sure you had them for, for your records here. And then finally, uh, I just wanted to have a quick word about knee injuries. Again, uh, the synovial joints of the body are the weakest because they allow for the greatest range of motion. This is a theme that we've touched upon many times in this presentation. Uh, uh, so if you have, for example, a strong blow to the lateral side of the extended knee, it can cause an injury. It can cause tearing of ligaments, damage to the meniscus, or a potentially rupture of the whole ligament. And surgery actually may be required to correct this. Okay, so that's it for this video lecture, uh, talking about articulations and joints. Next time we'll pick it up with a look at muscle tissue. Take care.